top ten country music songs of all time is Willie Nelson's version of My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys. It's an interesting song to me because it's clear that Willie loves cowboys, but he uses reverse psychology. Do you remember that? When he gives this advice to mothers everywhere, he says, Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Don't let them pick guitars and drive big old trucks. Make them be doctors and lawyers and such. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Of course, Willie really wanted there to be more cowboys. The song was a tribute to the people, as he said, who would rather give you a song than diamonds and gold. Cowboys may like smoky old pool rooms, but he said they also like clear mountain mornings and warm little puppies. They may wear Lone Star Star belt buckles and old faded Levi's, but Willie says he ain't wrong, he's just different, and his pride won't let him do the things that make you think he's right. Willie's heroes were cowboys. Well, folks like me who grew up with a book instead of a lariat wound up with a different kind of hero. I've been fascinated by all things religious, almost all my life. Preachers have dominated the landscape of my life like the Lone Ranger, Gene Autry, and John Wayne did for aspiring cowpokes. As I began to chronicle the heroes and the mentors that I most admired, I realized that in many cases they were not what you'd call the most socially acceptable folks like, as Willie said, doctors and lawyers and such. Instead, They were the outcasts like cowboys. They were the folks who went their own way. People who marched to a different drummer and who had the courage to stand against what I think were the false ideas accepted by truth as by so many others, even the majority. I guess it's when I realized that my heroes have always been heretics because Uh, By one group or another, they would call them that. Like cowboys who were not accepted in polite company, my heroes stood against, often stood against the mainstream of religious beliefs and attitudes. I thought about this again when I studied our text for today, and I noticed that the writer of the Gospel of John really did things differently. If you've ever read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have to know that John is just very different from the other three Gospels. In fact, the scholars call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels because they see together, see Jesus about the same way. John is just different. He accommodates the message to the hearers of his day. It was a pretty heretical thing to do. All the other Gospels begin with a traditional description of the birth of Jesus. But John chooses a very different approach. In John, there is no birth narrative. In John, there are no warm, fuzzy descriptions of the familiar Christmas story with the angel appearing to Mary the birth in the manger, the shepherds worshiping, the wise men coming. Instead, John adapts his message using strange terminology. He begins by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's unusual. The Greek word for word is Logos. And that word, that concept, was very important in Greek circles with Greek philosophers of the time. And John was trying to appeal to those who were Greeks. He knew that the Jewish idea of a Messiah would not have much appeal to his non-Jewish audience. So he searched for symbols that would speak to his Greek-educated audience. John realized that Christianity had to be packaged in familiar cultural concepts. I think in that way he colored 
outside the box. I'm afraid some might have even labeled John a heretic. But John was not alone in his unusual ways. I want to suggest to you that Jesus was a heretic too. He constantly flew in the face of the rigid ceremonial laws that the Pharisees thought were so important. One time he said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. His ideas and his actions were so heretical, so contrary to the popular view of religion of his day, that he was killed for his heresy. I want to suggest to you that Peter was a heretic. Because of his vision in Acts chapter 10, he completely changed the food laws of the Jewish tradition that were so important all the way through the Old Testament. I I find it one of the most remarkable events in the whole Bible. The Jewish faith had been largely defined by what people ate and didn't eat. Kosher food was important. Banned items were forbidden. And then one day Peter had a vision of food being lowered on a large sheet and a voice spoke to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, by no means, Lord, I have never eaten anything profane or unclean. And the voice of God came to him again and said, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And with that vision, forever after, Christians have been eating pork and lobster without a second thought. It's because Peter was such a heretic to overturn those food laws. Paul was a heretic. Paul advocated that Christians could come to God without first becoming a Jew. In so doing, he opened the gospel to the Gentiles. And I think it may have been Paul who first advocated Christians should change their day of worship. I just want you to think a minute. What if I were to suddenly say, we're no longer going to worship on Sunday. It's going to be Wednesday, folks. That would be a pretty heretical idea. One of the Ten Commandments is you shall keep the Sabbath. And friends, the Sabbath is Saturday. And these newfound Christians, like Paul, said Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. We're going to start worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday. I want to tell you, all of these people were heretics. Heretics all. And as I began to think about these biblical characters, I realized that all of my heroes have been heretics in one way or another. They weren't heretics in the sense that they didn't believe, that they believed something contrary to the Bible, but they were contrary to the prevailing understandings of their day. The most, the people I admire the most have been called heretics by somebody. Martin Luther has been called the most influential religious figure of the last 1,000 years. His 95 theses nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Church were labeled as heresy by many, but it marked the beginning of the Protestant Reformation and incredible changes for Christians in the second 1,000 years. 450 years later, Martin Luther King would be hated and despised as a heretic because he believed the Bible proclaimed equality for everybody, black and white. And like so many heretics before him, he was killed for his courage to be different. One of my first mentors is named John McClanahan who was pastor in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, where I was associate. He was a heretic. He was a young pastor in a small southern town, and he took courageous stands in the 1960s about relationships between blacks and whites. And 
he often was called a heretic. And in fact, the local newspaper wrote an article about his ministry and called him a maverick. And it was a title he would wear proudly. My next mentor was Dr. Don Harbuck in El Dorado, Arkansas. He refused to march to the lockstep commands of the fundamentalists who took control of his denomination. He and a handful of other progressive pastors met in Tennessee to strategize methods to try to stop the fundamentalist takeover, and they were called the Gatlinburg Gang. They would eventually lose the battle for the soul of that denomination. And his, he and his buddies and most of my seminary professors were labeled as heretics, though I don't think they were. When I first came to Disciples of Christ in the early 1990s, I found an instant affinity for the rallying cry of freedom of conscience. And I found myself again admiring men who were labeled as heretics by some. Thomas Campbell grew up in a church that required a test of orthodoxy before you could take communion. It was a simple process. You met with the pastor of the church. He asked you some questions about what you believe. If you believe the right thing, he gave you this little coin. It was called a communion token. And then on Sunday, you would have that token in your hand. And when you came forward, you placed that token on the table. And only with the token, only if you passed the test, could you have communion. One day, Thomas Campbell had done all that. He sat in the pew with his token in his hand. And he kept thinking, it's just wrong to put a fence around the Lord's table. And finally, he walked forward, placed his token on the table, refused communion, and walked out. His commitment to freedom of belief is the taproot of disciples' tradition. His former denomination called him a heretic. But to, to disciples, he's a hero. He's a founding father. Alexander Campbell and Martin Stone were called heretics because they thought the church should be organized based on the Bible alone and not on the doctrines of men like the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. Because of such heroes, I find myself with an aversion to forcing proper belief on church members. I have a couple of reasons for that. In the first place, most of the people that I have admired the most have earned their stripes by refusing to accept, accept coercion of belief. They stood against the belief Nazis who were eager to punch a list or check off a list of acceptable doctrines and social stances. I witnessed firsthand the tyranny of such a regime and the oppressive effect that it had. But the second reason I oppose coercion in the area of belief is that I don't think it does any good. You can force people to affirm doctrinal statements, that, but they really may not understand it, and they may not really believe it. And I don't believe having all the right doctrines checked off is what makes you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ. In my last church, I was surprised to learn that Doug was not a member of the church. Doug's wife was on the search committee that called me as pastor of their church. Doug's family and he were involved in the church and had been for 20 years. Every Sunday, Doug was there. And then I learned that Doug was not a member. And I finally asked him, Doug, you're here all the time. You're here more than people who are not members. Why aren't you a member of the church? And he said, well, I'm not sure about some of those doctrines of Christianity. And he said, I, I think it'd be hypocritical for me to stand up before the church and profess a faith that I have so many questions about. I guess Doug felt like a heretic. And I asked him, Doug, do you have a problem with Jesus? He said, well, no. And I said, well, you're a perfect member for the disciples of Christ. Jesus is all that matters. If you believe in Jesus, then we can disagree about everything else. Doug, let's just worship together. 
And he joined the church, and I'm glad that he did. I love that poem by John Oxenham. It says this, Not what, but whom I do believe, that in my darkest hour of need hath comfort, that no mortal creed to mortal man may give. Not what I do believe, but whom. Not what, but whom. Once you know him, we trust your doctrinal beliefs to God's correction. God, we believe, is the one who will have to correct your beliefs. We're going to listen respectfully to what you have to say because you, because you just might have a fresh word from God for us. After all, even a clock that doesn't run is right twice a day. I guess I've learned that I would much rather be around someone who has some wrong beliefs, but they reflect the spirit of Christ, than I would be around someone who is absolutely orthodox, but lacks anything of the spirit of Christ. And I've seen plenty of both. Make no mistake about it. This is a challenge for a local church like ours. As we have found out, it's not easy to keep together a church with such diversity. A recent visitor told his Sunday school class in this church that he wasn't very happy with his former church because the pastor there told him, you don't have to worry about what to believe. I'll tell you what to believe. Friends, that was not a Disciples of Christ church. Sometimes people come from other denominations and they love the freedom that's here until they hear something that they don't agree with and then they want everybody to agree with them and they leave. Listen, if you have to attend a church where nobody ever says anything you disagree with, then you're going to the wrong church. This is not the church for you. This church is made of a bunch of heretics <laughs> who think for themselves and are not easily coerced into agreeing with you. You need to know the kind of radical freedom for which this church stands. We agree on Jesus. Everything else is up for grabs. And we agree to disagree. You are free to believe what you believe, but you can't coerce anyone else to believe what you believe. I love heretics. All my heroes were heretics. Heretics really think about their faith, and they won't accept somebody else's conclusion just because they say it loudly. They wear their doubts, sometimes proudly at times. Sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes they are flat wrong. Quite often they are persecuted and rejected like, well, like cowboys. They lead a hard life. In the end, I find myself like Willie Nelson proclaiming a backhanded compliment to cowboys and heretics. I would rewrite Willie's song this way. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be heretics. Don't let them think for themselves and color outside the box. Make them follow tradition. Believe what they're taught. Mamas, don't let your babies grow up to be heretics. My heroes have always been heretics. Let us pray. Oh God, we give thanks to you today. That this is a place where people are encouraged to think for themselves. My, what a radical idea. But as we've witnessed through the scripture and through history, it was the people who thought from the cell, for themselves. It was the people who were open to fresh winds from the Spirit who have really influenced Christianity, our denomination, and even many of us.